Produced by Rooted in Rights, a program of Disability Rights Washington. Seattle City Council District 6, Transportation and Sustainability Candidate Forum. Hosted by the Mass Coalition, Transit Riders Union, Tech for Housing, and the Housing Consortium. My name is Matthew Lang. I'm your host this evening. And we have a wonderful panel of District 6 candidates. Let's give them a hand. Thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, quickly, I just want to tell you about a little bit about the Mass Coalition, what we do and who we are. Uh, the Mass Coalition is a coalition of organizations that believe Seattle can have a world-class multimodal transportation system that moves people effic efficiently and reliably. We can slash Seattle's carbon emissions and be a model for other cities by taking real action on climate change. We can have a city where people of all ages, intersections, can hop on a bus without getting stuck in gridlock. We can achieve Seattle's stated goal of zero traffic deaths and serious injuries by 2030. We can create an equitable transportation system that threats mo uh, mobility, treats mobility as a human right. Now, we don't do all these things right now, but we are pushing very hard at the city level and the county level to make things happen. Uh, the coalition includes the Sierra Club, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, the Transit Riders Union, uh, Seattle Subway, The Urbanist, Seattle Transit Blog, 500 Women Scientists, 350 Seattle, Rooted in Rights and Disability Rights Washington. Uh, thank you to Rooted in Rights for arranging uh, card captioning uh, this services this evening as well as a uh, film of the event. Uh, at the check-in table there were some pieces of paper to write things down. Also I think they were included on your seats. So if you have those, I'm going to float around really quick after uh, we get started and pick those up from you. But we will have some audience questions uh, toward the end of the event. Um, yeah, a big thank you to all of our volunteers this evening. Uh, and a uh, special thanks to Dave Schultz, a uh, Transit Riders Union men er, member who will be doing our timekeeping this evening. He's going to keep a pretty tight ship this evening so that we can keep things moving. Uh, if you like what you see this evening, please go to transitriders.org slash join and join the Transit Riders Union or visit masscoalition.org and take a look and connect with any of the other organizations that might suit your interests. Uh, the Transit Writers Union, we are a dues-based organization, so every member's contribution uh, ensures that we are able to continue the work that you are uh, witnessing here tonight. Now I'm going to hand over the reins to our amazing moderator for the evening, Heidi Groover of the Seattle Times. Thank you all for being here, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, before we get started, I want to ask the candidates that each time you speak, please identify yourself. Um, this is helpful for people who are low vision, might not be able to see your name tags here. As mentioned, we have the captioning as well. Um, I will be reading questions that were written by the organizers of this event. Um, and we will start with some questions for which you have one minute to answer then move to some where you have 30 seconds, then a lightning round where you will use these signs you have in front of you. Uh, and then we will move to audience questions. So please write down your questions and look for that volunteer who will be walking around to collect them. And we will be alternating who goes first so that uh, there's not one of you on the hook first each time. So uh, with that, let's start with just a quick uh, around 10 second or shorter introduction, just who you are and how you got here today. Please, uh, no stump speeches. We will start at the end with Jay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Dr. Jay Fabi, lifelong Seattle resident, dad, family physician. Happy to be here tonight and share some thoughts and hear from you. How did you get here? It was 10 seconds, right? How did you, <laughs> how did you get here? Like a bus, a car? Oh, how did I get here? Yeah. I took the bus here tonight. Okay. I, I thought you meant like, how, like the life story. <laughs> no, it's one it's a transportation forum, so we wanted to. I took the metro bus here tonight. Yeah. Sergio Garcia, I live in Fitty Ridge. I am a police officer in the district. Uh, I am uh, transplanted from Miami. I absolutely uh, love this place and I have an interesting perspective uh, from being stuck in just for in uh, traffic for nine hours a day um, to homelessness and public safety and uh, as well as having 
a renter and can't afford ever, ever, never to buy a house here. Um, and I walk here because I live up the, the street. Hello, my name is Melissa Hall. I'm an attorney. Um, I was a geographer before that. I got here tonight using a car sharing car because after this we have ballots of public, which we're going to, uh, which I and another candidate are going to carpool to. Hi, I'm Kate Martin, and I walked here from my home. Hi, I'm Joy Masso. I'm running uh, as an independent progressive, and uh, my wife dropped me off, and then I'm going to be carpooling with another candidate. <laughs> Good evening, I'm John Peoples, live in Green Lake, and I drove here from 7th and Stewart to just outside here in 16 minutes. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Terry Rice. I live in Ballard. I'm a small business leader, and I carpool here this evening. Hi, my name is Dan Strauss. I was born and raised in Ballard. I love this district immensely. I had the opportunity to carpool this evening. Hello, I'm Heidi Wills, and I live in Fremont. I'm running because I care very much about climate protection, and I was the second person in the state of Washington to get a hybrid vehicle. And I drove my hybrid vehicle tonight to get to the house party right after this. Hello, my name is Ed Hockhart, and uh, I'm a planner with Seattle Tuscan Affiliation, and I'd like to go over here at my other time, but I'm cooling off right now. Okay, uh, we can start from this end since you already have the mic. Uh, these are one minute answers, and please again identify yourself before you answer. Uh, the first question How can we make Seattle streets, including sidewalks and intersections, safer and more accessible for everyone, including people with disabilities? Specifically, do you support installing automated traffic enforcement cameras, implementing speed limit reductions, and banning rights on red? You are first. Uh, Ed Packard here. Um, I fully support um, automated um, camera enforcement and uh, 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 banning right turns on red. Um, I think pedestrian safety is really critical. Uh, here in the city of Seattle, we have a vision uh, zero. Our goal of eliminating uh, traffic, uh, pedestrian fatality, and serious injury by 2030. And uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, I think one thing I would uh, push for is uh, building out a um, uh, connected network of protected biking throughout the city and also uh, fully embracing the concept of, of complete streets where you have sidewalks uh, to, uh, with curb ramps so that people with disabilities can navigate uh, much more easily around the city. Yes to everything, and um, we also need more crosswalks to improve safety. We also need more marked sidewalks to improve safety. We need infrastructure improvements in our city. One fourth of our city still does not have sidewalks, just basic um, safety measures for <coughs> pedestrians. I've been on the city council before. I was there in the year 2000 to 2003, and I was an advocate for transportation infrastructure improvements, uh, giving me the nickname Sidewalk Wills. And I will be an advocate again if I get the opportunity. Please remember to identify yourself before you're speaking. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan Strauss, and I absolutely believe in lowering speed limits, especially in residential areas. I was hit by a driver while I was riding a bike in Ballard, and I spent four days in Harborview Hospital. Uh, the outcomes could have been very different after that day had the car been larger or made of metal. And one of the reasons I was hurt so badly was because of how fast it was moving. I worked on trying to create, uh, not allowing for blocking the box automated enforcement since 2014. Um, absolutely support banning right on red because that's how big cities operate. I would take it a step farther and say that we should be able to allow all pedestrian crossing for all crossing, like all directions. Um, and absolutely in favor of protected bike lanes 
uh, connected network of protected pipelines and a connected network of transit only lines. We absolutely need complete streets in our city. My name is Terry Rice. Uh, I do support lowering the speed limits in the city, uh, especially in those residential zones. Uh, automated traffic cameras to keep cars from blocking the, side, the intersections and camera enforcement for that, and as well as banning those right hand turns. But this goes into also how do we go beyond that to build a really safe infrastructure. So that means focusing in on the bike master plan and getting that through to completion in its original form. And it means final mile investments. So things like crosswalks that light up and have flags, sidewalks that have curb cuts and that are wide enough, and an infrastructure of bike lanes that allows for uh, riders to move between the most important parts of the city and between the residential parts of the city. So that interconnected bike infrastructure, as well as the future infrastructure for transit, the, whether it's electric scooters or other sorts of forms of transit that we don't know about yet or that are coming soon. So that's how we build that inclusive, uh, accessible, and safe transportation. I'm John Peoples, and I am a big fan of sidewalks, the curb ramps. I'm all for adding more ramps that is not my phone. And um, I'm a, good, a big fan of repaint the lines. I absolutely uh, disagree with the use of camera enforcement. If you want enforcement, hire more police officers. Let the human beings do it. Uh, schools only for the camera enforcement. The speed limit, we just reduced the speed limit to 20 miles an hour in residential areas. I don't see the reason to reduce it more. Not only do I do not agree with banning a right turn on red, but I'm a fan of left turn on red if it's one way to one way. Curb to curb, there is room for all of us. Buses, bikes, cars, trucks. We share the road and pedestrians, and I like the all-way walk as well. Um, we need to share the road. There's enough room for all of us and we can move everyone through town safely uh, without uh, restricting one user in favor of other users. And that's it, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Joey Massa. I absolutely support these uh, automated camera systems. In fact, I was caught by one not too long ago, and I'll tell you, I learned my lesson. The data bears out that these systems show great impact on helping folks to realize the existing laws we have. I think the policy of giving folks warnings for the first six months in efforts like this, one of our consistent issues as a city has been voter education, letting folks know about the semi-drastic changes that we're making. Uh, further, as far as sidewalk accessibility, I think there's great work to be done as far as enabling uh, disabled individuals to, to travel down sidewalks. Uh, my wife and I are both rather able-bodied, but I tell you what, every night I carry a flashlight with me because there are so many cracks in so many of our existing sidewalks. We have so much work to do in our infrastructure. I think we should be looking at jobs programs to be working on these issues. Uh, to be expanding our bike network path to path, leaning away from things like sharrows and half half-minded compromises and leaning fully into more effective solutions. I'm Kate Martin. Um, I'd like to respond to this question in a couple of ways. Um, I served on the Pedestrian Master Plan Advisory Group. I also served on uh, a couple other transportation committees along the years. I've been involved for about 20 years. The um, speed limit reduction is a no-brainer. Um, the kind of injuries that people sustain when they're in an accident, when there's uh, low low traffic speeds is completely different. Um, and we've had some incredibly awful uh, pedestrian car accidents historically in this district. So I, I really support that. I've often been thinking around Green Lake, it would be really great to have a reduced speed limit. Enforcement sounds really good. I'd love to see crosswalk enforcement. I'd love to see cops out there actually um, ticketing people for not yielding the right of way to the crosswalk. Um, yeah, I'd like to finish the sidewalk network, the Greenway network, and the natural drainage network. Um, it's super upsetting up on 92nd with the Greenway from Crown Hill to the new schools on Aurora that there's no sidewalks and there's no signs telling the kids to walk facing the traffic. So those are all improvements we could make. My name is Melissa Hall. Reduce speed limits, yes. Better sidewalks, 
gas. They're in fairly poor condition in a lot of the city that has them. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of ending turn right on red because we are an urban city. Um, traffic camera enforcement, absolutely, if we can get authorization. It doesn't look like we are going to get authorization, so I would like to experiment with moving the stoplights to the other side of the street so that you can't see them if you're in the crosswalk, which is a behavioral change that has been shown to be effective in preventing blocking the box and get up and doesn't require additional authorization for the legislature. Um, the, um, I'm sorry. And um, yes to a protective bike lane. Um, I would very much like to see our street safety program focus on pedestrians because I am a pedestrian, but also because a walkable city is a livable city. Sergio Garcia, in uh, almost 15 years of police work, I've seen people get hit by parked cars, so I've seen a ton of things out there. Uh, I am all for finishing sidewalks and improving the infrastructure of them. Uh, no to red light cameras, uh, because we don't know where the money goes. The money does not go back to the city, and it takes away um, the ability to give breaks for people who have a legitimate reason as to why they're on the red light causes also people to stop in the middle of the street. It causes accidents. If anything, it does not cause the uh, traffic flow, uh, a normal traffic flow. Uh, yes, to lowering the speed limit, uh, wherever there is studies that show they need to be lowered, and there is a process for that. Um, bike shares of blocking sidewalks is also a big thing. We're going into, we want more scooters and more bike shares, but they're blocking the sidewalk, and for somebody that has limited mobility, it is a problem. I have had to gotten up get out of my police car and move 37,000 uh, line bikes out of the intersection. This is Jay Fadi. I have a quick personal story regarding two of the three uh, tenants that we're talking about. This was probably about 10 years ago. We lived in the neighborhood for 21 years and my wife and I have two sons who are now 16 and 14. Uh, they were in the car with me and um, anyway, jumping ahead, I got a ticket in the mail that said you got a ticket for uh, running a red light, taking a right turn at Market and uh, 15. And I said, no, I didn't. So I wasn't even there that day. I don't remember that. So click right here on this video link. I sat down with my kids. They were about five and seven. And there was a picture of me uh, with them on the car running through it. But in all seriousness, absolutely, I support all three of those things. We can achieve vision zero, zero no question. All these injuries and deaths essentially are preventable. I support all three of those things as a family physician and as a public health doctor. I have taken care of so many people that have been injured, have been injured some severely, uh, and we can definitely drop that and get to vision zero by adopting policies like these three things. Okay, uh, Jay, first for the next question. What does racial equity mean to you, and how does it affect your approach to land use, transportation planning, and public outreach? What does racial equity mean to me, and how does it, can you say that one more time, how does it? How does it affect your approach to land use, transportation planning, and public outreach? Okay, that is a very challenging question to answer in 60 seconds. Um, <laughs> Everybody has inherent bias. Everyone has, uh, everyone experiences. We have institutional racism that is, is built in. Um, we all have implicit bias. We have to take active measures to address those biases. Um, and those things need to be integrated into our policies regarding transportation, housing, uh, and everything we do uh, as a city from a, from a municipal government standpoint. Um, there, I know the city has a racial equity toolkit, uh, and many other organizations uh, have such a thing. Um, these are things that need to continue to be pushed. Uh, I think Seattle is a national leader uh, in many ways in this area, but uh, the work is far from done, and we need to uh, continue on all the, the path that we're already on. This is Sergio Garcia, and uh, I, I, this is a, this is a big one for me. I think that. We, we are doing a good job as of now. I think that there is definitely room for more improvement. Uh, my story with that is I am trying to have my mother and father move out here. Uh, my mother grew up in an environment that she went into sixth grade and she, started, uh, she needed to start cleaning houses at that age. Uh, she, was ne she never had the luxury to ride a bicycle, right? Now she has uh, two bad knees, slightly overweight, doesn't speak English, 
And uh, my pitch to her is move to Seattle so you can ride a bicycle uphill, downhill in the rain and the cold and put all your gear and equipment in the back. It doesn't make sense. So although I am, um, I am advocating for alternative means of transportation, I think education is huge. Same thing for housing. Uh, you know, we, we, we need to have these people sit at the table and actually see what it is that they need. We need the people that we're trying to target at the table to have these conversations and not just anybody make the decisions for them. I'm Melissa Hall. When it comes to racial equity, my ma mantra in this is plan with, not for. I can't pretend that I can see past my biases and experiences. I can only know that my bias and experiences exist and I need people with other perspectives at the table. We will never get past the history of redlining if we don't deeply acknowledge it. So planning is the area where I think our history of racism most needs to be confronted in a systemic way. That looks like having people at the table, but it also looks like community support. And that looks like going to the community and saying, hey, what do you need from us in order to be stronger? Um, as far as transportation, we know that there's a modal split and what side of the modal split you're on um, depends on, well, Cars get more money, we know this. That's a thing that we can change at the local level. It's not written in stone. Um, Kate Martin speaking right now. Um, I had an interesting opportunity to get a window into equity. I was married for 25 years to a Mexican immigrant and um, for a white girl that was raised in a white neighborhood, it really gave me some uh, perspective on uh, what really goes on, including when my son was in high school at Roosevelt and they just assumed that he wasn't going to college because he had a Mexican last name. It was fascinating. Um, from the land use perspective, um, I'm really tired of us cramming all of the um, lower income families onto um, arterial streets. Um, I think that's a complete injustice. Um, I'd like to maintain 35% lot coverage so we have enough room for the trees and the water to get back into the ground and all the other great things that happen about carbon reduction by having less land, less land coverage. Um, I'd like to get uh, more people renting from uh, owner occupants in those neighborhoods. I live in a house of eight people um, that I share with seven others, and uh, I would like to encourage everyone to do um, that kind of thing, to tuck a few more people into their house. I really believe in ownership, so I'd like to get more ownership across all income brackets. Hi, uh, Joey Massa again. Um one part of my history that's very important to me is I grew up on the Gulf Coast in Baton Rouge and, and, Louis, and Lafayette, Louisiana. And uh, one of the things you see there is, is the impact of disparity and focusing on certain sects of population and how damaging that can be culturally. Uh, further here in Seattle, we aren't far removed from those histories and those injustices throughout our time. Uh, so focusing on not the loudest voices, not the most populous voices, but rather on voices equally is vital. In my campaign, I've made sure to surround myself with diverse voices, with advisors across different uh, class and population brackets, and um, really emphasizing repaying our dues to those societies, I think, is, is vital. Thank you. I'm John Peoples, and every single person is an individual, and the rules apply to everyone. Two wrongs do not make a right. Um, when it comes to planning, I like the plan with, not for. Invite everyone. Everyone has a choice to show up or not. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Treat others like you'd like to be treated and make a household budget. All right. Racial equity to me means understanding the historic uh, inequities as well as the institutional bias that exists in our policies and in our budgets and in how we have historically allocated resources uh, so that in Seattle looks a lot like the exclusionary zoning practices that have been in place for a very long time. We know that often as redlining. And the result of that, the long-term result of that has been that multifamily units and affordable units are 
infrequently available in neighborhoods that tend to be more white or more affluent and that they're tucked into certain neighborhoods. And today, a lot of that affordable housing or what we understand to be affordable housing is built in a very small number of neighborhoods. But it goes much beyond just the housing and land use. This idea of where we need to be talking about racial equity and using the tools available, like the King County Toolkit, should infiltrate every part of government and every policy. Hi, this is Dan Strauss. Uh, sy systemic racism is a part of our society and it needs to be addressed. I understand that if information is presented to me in a way that it makes sense to me, it doesn't mean that it's smart. It just means that it's presented to me in a way that I understand it. And for me, I understand that implicit bias is also throughout our community. I've had the opportunity at the city of Seattle to work on racial equity toolkits. I understand that if the 17 bus route on Sunset Hill needs more service, that also means that the number seven bus route needs more service. I look to work with my community partners and learn from them and to take direction in areas that I don't have the answer to. And it's really important to me that as we develop our city, we do it in a way that is equitable for all of us in Seattle. Thanks, I'm Heidi Wills. I had an opportunity to meet someone just two days ago who um, experienced redlining when she moved to our area from Mississippi, and that's Dr. Maxine Hayes. And you may have heard of her. She was our Secretary of Health for the state of Washington, but she couldn't get a home near Children's Hospital when she moved here to be a doctor in our region. Um, the history of um, Segregation and racial injustice is deep in our community and we do need to acknowledge that. I had the opportunity to work for 13 years in South Seattle and work with children in communities that are underserved um, and see firsthand how there are fewer opportunities um, for children of color in our community than there are um, for kids who aren't. And I think that um, organizations like the one I had an opportunity to run called The First T that uses um, life skills and mentorship to help young people um, can help build successful futures. Yeah, Pat Hearth, I think that Terry gave a very good um, explanation of racial um, equity and uh, systemic, systemic racism. And uh, for me, um, they get deeply um, embedded when it comes to land use and housing issues as well as transportation. Take um, land use and housing. In the city of Seattle, we have um, single family zoning that covered um, around two thirds of the city. And that did not come about um, overnight. It, 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 it was brought up over a long, several decades. And it, 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 um, it has had the impact of dampening the amount of how uh, the amount of affordable housing stock available and in in seattle and in many other communities throughout the country people of color and people with disabilities uh, have lower incomes and are less able to afford uh, single family homes and so i think we need to look at the single family housing policy in the city okay uh, heidi you're first on this question this is a scenario. Uh, in your district, SDOT has proposed to redesign a street to make it safer and predicts that the changes will result in fewer deaths and serious injuries. However, this redesign will slow down vehicle traffic by 30 seconds each way and lead to a loss of 50 parking spaces. As a result, the community is split about whether this project is good for your neighborhood. How would you manage this controversial project? You get to be last. Yeah. You get to think about it longer. Um, are you sure this is hypothetical? Um, I think that the, um, the goals, right, if we keep coming back to the goals, right, I mean, uh, we really need to have conversations as a community on how we're going to be safer and lower our carbon footprint. And if those are our goals, right, we want to be carbon neutral by the year 2050. 
That's the goal established by the city of Seattle. And to get there, we're going to have to make hard choices. Um, and I think we need to continue to have that conversation as a community, as a whole, right? Because if, there's going to be trade-offs to get there. Um, and we might lose some car storage along our streets. Um, but what we gain is so much more. This is Dan Strauss. And this is a situation that sounds very familiar to one that I've worked on recently. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is that we need to be able to meet our residents where they are and when they have trouble understanding the fact that increased bicycle infrastructure will allow more people to access their stores. When we have protected bike lanes and when we have bicycle infrastructure, it increases the amount of people that are actually able to access the space. And with um, car storage on public space, it oftentimes decreases the ability for people to access. Even though it's been the way we've always done it, doesn't mean it's the way of the future. And we need to be able to work to build a progressive and equitable future for all of us here in Seattle. Just a reminder, the question was, how would you manage this controversial project? So hoping to hear about how you would manage the controversy around the project. Terry Rice. I would want to hear from the community that's affected by it. I'd want to spend time in that community and understand what their fears are about the project, what their concerns are about the project, and what their aspirations are for their neighborhood and for that area. And then we do have to make hard decisions. We have a serious problem in our city with pedestrian and with biker safety and with a lack of infrastructure to support better safety. And we're in the middle of a climate crisis. So we have to make different decisions about how we use our road space and how we use our land space if we're going to make meaningful and substantial progress. But that doesn't mean that we want to leave folks out in the dust. I'm a small business leader, and there are real concerns for small businesses in Seattle that are already facing pressures from rising costs of rent, rising costs of labor. So what can we do as a city to help the small businesses that fear that that absence of street parking or car storage is going to have a negative impact on their business? What can we do to help support them as we make the hard decisions we need to make in order to really move our city forward. I'm John Peoples, and as far as uh, managing the controversy goes, definitely want to listen to all of the stakeholders, the pedestrians, the bike riders, the automobile drivers, and those who need to find parking when they drive uh, various places. So listen to the stakeholders and sit down with everyone, even those who are opposed to each other. Get them all at a table, two, three people, and uh, explain their various fears and concerns to each other, and uh, look for ways to find common ground. And then uh, when it does come to uh, making those hard choices, people can be kept safe um, without slowing down traffic and removing parking. Uh, things like eye contact and waving people through and being good neighbors and knowing that um, everyone has um, a place on our streets and it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both. Hi, uh, Joey Massa again. Uh, one of the many reasons I decided to get into politics and specifically into this position uh, is the lack of communication between our elected leaders and our residents. I got my start in this city as a bouncer, and one of the most vital skills for a bouncer, bouncer is clear and effective communication, active listening, and being able to redirect frustrations into productive means. And so a lot of the times that ex means explaining why, even though this might not seem convenient for you right now, it's convenient for all of us in the long term, it's gonna be helpful for you in the future, and that the choices we make right now are gonna lead us to a better tomorrow, whether that means a hangover or you know, not bumping someone who you didn't see crossing a crosswalk. So thank you. Uh, this is Kate Martin speaking. Um, I'm a planner by profession, and so I'm really interested in great planning processes and um, basically creating win-wins. I feel like we've made a lot of mistakes with incredibly top-down kind of situations. We don't want to do what happened on 35th. We don't want to do what happened on Roosevelt. We don't want to do what happened on 65th with super top-down decisions. 
When I first got involved in neighborhood planning back in the end of the 90s, we had a bottom-up planning process where the neighborhood solved the problem that they were asked to solve. We did a great job doing that. I would suggest that we go back to doing bottom-up neighborhood plans where we're not punishing businesses, we're not punishing people, older people, people with children, and we're creating win-wins for everybody. This is Melissa Hall. In this situation, the city council doesn't have a lot of authority and there's a limited ability to manage the controversy. The problem is that we keep having this conversation over and over again. Instead of constantly fighting individual little battles over specific street redesigns, I think that the answer is to be more comprehensive. We did this when we did transit redesign. We can come up with objective standards for street redesign every time we resurface streets and apply them objectively and in a way that makes sense throughout the entire city. The fact of the matter is, as much as we care about what people think in their backyards, you're gonna make biased decisions in your backyard because that's gonna affect you in a different way than it affects the rest of the city. We need to sit down, have that real hard conversation about what's best for the city and come up with level of service standards for all of the roadway and not just the part that cars go on. Sergio Garcia, and uh, sorry I was writing, I, I was looking, I was doing the math on my phone here, but th the question is how do we manage the controversy? Uh, I have almost 30,000 hours of managing uh, controversy now. Uh, when people call me, I never show up and it's never people like, hey, you know, we kind of agree and we called you just to tell you that we agree. Uh, <laughs> it's always controversy and I have to make that decision. I cannot leave. Uh, that location until we resolve uh, either short term, long term, or come up with uh, great ideas. Uh, and this is controversy that comes from uh, my neighbor's a tree is covering my uh, my yard, or uh, you know, marriage issues or other personal things. So uh, it's a skill set that I've been able to develop, and I intend to uh, utilize it if I get that opportunity. This is Jay Fathi. How to manage the controversy. <clears throat> First of all, it's very important to define what problem are we trying to solve. And everyone needs to be on the same page for that. I would use the skills that I've used as a physician for over 25 years, which is number one, to listen. You want your physicians to listen to you and make sure you are heard and they are considering things. And number two, you want them to implement a plan that is evidence-based, that's going to follow data, and you're going to track it and follow it. Um, I would also manage it by utilizing the skills that I've employed in every job that I've ever had, which is bringing groups together to solve difficult problems, whether that is recreating a brand new health plan for uh, thousands of unionized nurses and healthcare workers at Swedish for the benefit of the health of their health and their families, or working with two huge government agencies in Olympia to put 25,000 foster kids on a streamlined, unified health plan across Washington State. I've had success doing those things, and um, I trust that, that sort of, those sort of skills would uh, serve me well at managing this controversy. Uh, Pat Hart, I think, I think that the city council members have a responsibility not only to represent people, but also to help people understand city policies and goals. So in the case of this controversy, I would uh, talk with people and share with them that we're trying, we reduce, we want to help increase pedestrian safety by lowering speed limits. Uh, we want to eliminate pedestrian fatalities and serious injuries and keep our family, elders, and children safe. With regard to parking, I would want to help uh, people understand that we are trying to become a more carbon-friendly city. We're trying to provide more transit options for people, more mobility options, including bicycling and scootering. And change can be hard. Uh, uh, but one thing we have to keep in mind is that, uh, in my view especially, arterials are primarily for mobility. Um, I think that parking should be a much lower priority, especially for arterial streets. And I think if we can help people understand that, they will come around. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, all right, Dan, you're going to be a first for this. Uh, the United Nations Climate Report tells us we have about 11 years to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 50%. Given that more than 50% of Seattle's greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation, what are the highest priority actions to put Seattle on the path to decarbonization? Absolutely. So again, this is Dan Strauss. It's creating transit only lanes so that we are able to use our transit that we have that allows you to go to your bus stop, catch a bus within 10 minutes, get where you're going without getting stuck in traffic. The reason that I've heard that a lot of people who desire to use buses don't is because the uh, frequency of the bus and or because express buses stop running uh, after a certain period of time that there's not as much service as they desire we can use the Seattle Transportation Benefit District funding in uh, more expansive ways. Uh, we can work with King County Metro to expand the amount of coaches that we have and the amount of drivers that we have. And when we have reliable and frequent service, it will allow people to be able to rely on the bus. I currently, if I don't catch my bus, I take a bus every day. If I don't catch my bus by 6.15, uh, the, my, my 20 minute ride becomes over an hour. I think it begins with more uh, a, a, B, C lanes or anything but car lanes. So lanes for buses, lanes for bicycles. It also, we have to look at ensuring that there's adequate coverage from Metro Transit for all parts of the city so that all neighborhoods are well served and have options when it comes to Metro Transit. We wanna look at things like frequency to make sure that the bus is running often enough. Uh, ST3 can be expedited by doing things like waiving permits and helping to expedite the permits to get that built. And then finally, looking into the final mile of Metro Transit to ensure that sidewalks are, are well maintained, that crosswalks feel safe and, are, and they light up so people feel comfortable crossing the street to get to their Metro station, ensuring real-time tracking of buses through an app, giving people greater ways to pay. We want to reduce the friction, reduce the pain points in becoming a Metro rider so that it becomes the easy option, so that people want to choose that over their car and that they know that it'll be fast, it'll be safe, and it'll be reliable. We should definitely increase the number of buses on the streets. That will encourage those who want to ride the buses to ride the buses rather than drive everywhere with more buses on the streets, more routes along the arterials. More people will be on the buses and fewer, people, fewer cars will be on the street. That way it's done naturally, organically, and we don't demonize people who aren't doing things the way we do them. And so, and in addition, the buses need to be uh, engineered in a way that they're not belching out um, dirty uh, particles, because um, buses aren't uh, squeaky clean either. Um, nowhere uh, in my vision of Seattle is there an ABC lane. Curb to curb, there's room for us all. And lastly, so many of those um, Al Gore United Nations predictions over the last 34 years have been wrong. <laughs> Joey Massa here again. Um, emphasizing shared transit options, whether that means effective private solutions such as uh, shared bicycles, scooters if they're viable, uh, reach now and Lime cars, those types of things, uh, helping folks to make the choice to move away from individual car ownership and lean into shared vehicle and shared transit options. Uh, one, of my part, one of my campaign planks that I'm most excited about is expanding our passenger ferry system, uh, creating terminals in North Seattle and even on Lake Washington and Lake Union, uh, expanding our options for getting folks off of the road period in general and onto better uh, shared transit uh, opportunities and really creating trust in our transit systems that as individuals we can move away from personal car ownership. Uh, the other week I was trying to get down to South Lake Union and there was no effective way other than a two hour ride in a bus for me to get down there. And so I drove my car and then while I was down there, three rail cars passed me with no one on them. So, you know, choices like that make it frustrating. <coughs> this is Kate Martin speaking. Um, I'd like to quote Jarrett Walker. I don't know if you read his blog called Human Transit, but it's super fantastic. And he always says that transit needs to be a choice that a person in the free world would make 
and we have some improvements to the system that we have to make that true. However, we are making quite a bit of progress. The things that I could suggest for our neighborhood would be um, when we do that light rail tunnel, let's just run it all the way up to Crown Hill. That would really help. Let's consider what I call a beach bus that hits all the parks, Golden Gardens, Green Lake, Warren Magnuson Park, and just circulates us on some micro transit. I think that would really help. As I mentioned, definitely finish the sidewalk and greenways network. That would get a lot more people out. I just think that we're, um, well, of course, we're going to have more electric vehicles and more self-driving cars or however that's going to um, unfold. But when I went to the climate summit um, and they featured Portland last weekend, um, the things that they're doing, they're, they've so come so far in achieving their goals that 171 action steps that they're taking, I think we can emulate some of what they're doing down in Portland. Thank you. Melissa Hall, I think the most effective way to get people out of cars is to change our urban form. It's something we're going to have to do anyway because we don't have enough space for the people who live in Seattle. Transit users, walkers, people who use non-car based transportation live in dense compact spaces. They live in small towns and big cities. And this is what we have to create if we want people to change the way that they get around. We need to change the places that they need to go. Um, slow densification, we can't do it without the uh, resources and support networks. We'll encourage people to walk around in their neighborhoods more and use transit to get between neighborhoods because it's not a huge uh, lift to get um, from one neighborhood to another. Um, looking to urban form as a way to revise the way that we get around is ultimately the way that we're going to solve car dependency and the climate problem. Sorry. Thank you. This is Sergio Garcia, and I think that we're all going to agree. We've been to a couple of forums already here, and everybody's going to agree that the, the answer here is in public transportation. So I'm not going to go over that. I think what we need to do here is start thinking outside the box and start addressing some of the people that cannot choose the alternative means of transportation. My mother that can't ride the bicycle, or me who can't respond to your calls for service on the Metro bus as much as I would love to. It just wouldn't work out. So there's a couple of things that we could get creative here with uh, alternative work schedules for city employees. I work five days a, a week, but if I were to work four, uh, four days, uh, 10 hour shifts, I made a little math here, uh, that would take away one, uh, one day a week, that's 11,700 hours of uh, you know, giving out uh, fumes of my vehicle, that is 655,000 hours a year, uh, that is equivalent to 728,000 pounds of carbon a year, just me alone. Um, and if you make that with all the city departments, those are just ways to think outside of the box here. We could also hire uh, crossing guards to assist us, uh, uh, maybe. Hey, it's Jay Fadi. Let's just um, be perfectly clear that climate change is a very real existential threat to the human race and planet Earth. Uh, our cities have been designed around cars for the last century. And that absolutely needs to change. This is a fundamentally, critically important time moving forward here. We have to get people out of their cars. A lot of the things have already been discussed. In Seattle, we have geographic limitations. We have to expedite light rail. We have to get more buses. We have to try to get more bus-only lanes. We have to look at these alternative things, such as scooters. Make, and we can't do this without addressing density, because we need to have more walkability, and we need to have more sorts of urban villages where people don't need to get around as much. And I think uh, we're on a, a good track. in Seattle. And me, that means um, several things. It means um, having greater density in our urban villages and centers throughout the city, uh, close to frequent transit service. It means uh, improving our transit service throughout the city, maybe having micro transit connecting the urban villages. Light rail is not going to be enough to um, meet our transit uh, solution. Uh, but I would look at ways to accelerate the construction of light rail. Right now, 
the construction schedule dependent on the flow of revenue. If we can speed that flow of revenue up, perhaps by congestion pricing, um, that might be a way to get the light rail system in place sooner than later. And um, I think that um, converting, to a, um, converting to electric vehicles is an important component as well. We need bold action. When I was on the city council 20 years ago, I had the opportunity to help lead the way for Seattle City Light to become carbon neutral by divesting in coal power, investing in wind power, and creating the green power program for solar projects. I helped lead uh, the rewrite of the commercial energy code to be one of the strongest in the country. But we really need to be multimodal, um, more walkable, more bikeable. We need to electrify our city. We have an opportunity to fall along the lines of Metro, which is committed uh, to have all electric buses by the year 2040, uh, to do that with sound transit, too. Uh, they're going to go in the next year to buy at least 60, if not 100 buses to come through our communities, looking at reliability and cost and not the overlay of being carbon neutral. We need a leader on the city council to lead bold action on these initiatives, and I'll do that. Terry, you are first for this question. Uh, Seattle has the most regressive tax system of any state in Washington state, which has the most regressive tax system of any state in the United States. Do you believe Seattle needs significant new revenue to address housing and transportation needs? And if so, what specific tax policies would you advocate for at the city level? We do need new tax policy for sure, and that starts by continuing to take the fight to Olympia to move away from a primarily sales-based and property tax-based revenue system and to an income tax to we can have a more equitable approach to this. However, in the interim, we do have some really serious challenges from housing affordability to our response to homelessness and the infrastructure that we've been talking about that we need to build today, and that's going to take money. It's not clear at this point how much revenue we're going to need to raise, but one area that I do want to raise additional revenue is by beginning to tax uh, vacant rental units for large landowners. So this is not a tax that would apply to someone who owns five units or 10 units or 15 units, but if you own more than 50 units in the city of Seattle and you have units that are sitting vacant for more than 90 days, we're gonna to begin to tax those vacant rental units and we're gonna use that revenue to invest it back into the city of Seattle around transportation projects and affordability projects. We most certainly do not have a revenue problem. We're just spending too much of what we do take in. We have plenty of revenue. And um, uh, we, can, uh, we do have a balanced budget, thank you very much. But what we need is a rainy day fund to prepare for an unfortunate, unforeseen disaster in the future. And um, as far as uh, personal accountability goes, there is plenty that each individual can do to reduce his expenses, uh, roommates, and reducing personal expenses, uh, seeking higher um, uh, paying work, seeking lower count cost housing. Um, all these uh, individuals can do to mitigate uh, what some see as this um, uh, what I consider to be a perfectly fair taxing system, except that they keep adding more to it. Hi, uh, Joey Massa again. Not to get back on this horse, but there are multiple reasons why I jumped into this race. Uh, one of those is a few years ago, I was working as a project management or sorry, a project manager in construction. Uh, the three cardinal rules of project management are timeline, scope, and budget. That highlighted my interest in our city's inability to make any three of those categories in almost every project that we ran. So do we need more revenue? To be honest, I'm not sure yet. I th believe we need an audit of our city's internal services to make sure that we're spending our budget uh, effectively and not wasting money uh, in those means. Further, as a progressive, I stand against further regressive taxes and fees, such as the soda sweetened beverage fee, which affects uh, lower income populations more than higher income populations, uh, road fees that are not revenue neutral, and other means along those ends. Yeah, it's really a question, do we need more money? I mean, the city budget has gone up in just the last few years from $4 billion to $6 billion. 
Um, Boston is a city of our size, and they operate on, I think, 1.5 billion less than we do. They have twice as many cops as we have, and I can tell you that it was safe to walk the streets when I was there, and there was no disorder going on. I think that um, in our tax system, most of our taxes are going to the education system, which I consider a completely fossilized organism that needs reform. Only 50% of the kids are learning to read, write, or do math in that system, and we really need to be loading, front-loading um, the investment in a kid's first thousand days and not be worrying quite as much about whether we're paying for their community college. I think that would make a, a huge difference. Um, I do realize it's a regressive tax system. If the, if the lead-up is to say, do I support an income tax, I don't. Um, but I really support us going in and, um, to your point, just uh, really auditing what we're doing and making sure that we're not so wasteful. Oh, thank you. This is Melissa Hall. I think taxes are our way of returning luck's share back to the community because luck doesn't even, isn't evenly distributed and money isn't evenly distributed and we do our best to fight against those sorts of things. Unfortunately, our ability to respond to the aggressive, uh, regressive tax system is very limited right now. That's mostly out of the city council's hands. And in terms of what we can do, well, personally, I hope that the high earners tax has a really good day in court this summer, but that's wishful thinking. Um, realistically, in order to meet the challenges that we have ahead of us, we need more income. And there's only one tax that I can find that the city of Seattle has ever collected that it's not currently collecting, and that's a head tax or a payroll tax. So unfortunately, that's where we have to look right now because we don't have a ton of options. Um, I do hope that we get a more inclusive, less regressive tax system, and I would definitely support that. Thank you. This is Sergio Garcia, and do I think that we have a regressive tax system? Yeah. Uh, it's pretty bad. Uh, that being said, I, I agree with uh, Kate and Melissa here. It's, it's kind of out, out of our hands right now. Um, I also think that we need to uh, comb through the money that we're currently spending. I think that uh, we've lost, as residents, we've lost complete trust and uh, how responsible uh, local government is being with our money. Um, I know that uh, the more money we get throughout the years, if it is not evaluated or audited, a lot of this money just sits around and we don't know what happens with it. I could give you an example just within my department. Um, we don't buy our police cars. Police cars are worth normally $25,000, $35,000. We have the fleet department, uh, fleet and services department, which purchases those cars and, and turns around and leases them to the police department four times the rate. So we end up paying $100,000 per police car. That's money right there that we could utilize for affordable housing. Um, they do the same thing with our police radios. <clears throat> hey, it's Jay Fathi. We are a state that is very proud of being blue. And we are a city that's very proud of being very, very blue. The fact that we have the most regressive tax system in the country is unconscionable. It is absolutely infuriating. We need to do everything we can to move away from that. I personally believe that those that have more should pay more, whether it's an individual or it's a corporation or a business. I believe in a state income tax. I support capital gains tax. I support uh, working families tax credit from the state level. So we need to continue to work with our state partners who are pushing hard for those types of reforms to occur. From the city standpoint, yes, there needs to be accountability. The government budget of the city seems to be growing and growing and growing. And uh, I eagerly anticipate serving you on the council to look at the numbers and crack the books open and. and strive for some more increased accountability. That said, on the homelessness issue alone, Seattle spends two to three times less than other cities our size. We are going to need to spend more money to ad address that crisis. To build more affordable housing, I think it would be worthwhile to uh, go back and look at the uh, employee hour tax that we proposed uh, last year. I know it did not have a, a good outcome. However, I think that uh, it could have been fashioned in a, in a way to make it more uh, <coughs> acceptable to businesses. I think we could have done a better job 
job of bringing businesses to the table and maybe having the tax be on gross profits rather than gross revenue, and also making the tax a little bit, making it more progressive. Um, as proposed originally, it only had two tiers, um, so it was somewhat regressive in some ways. And I think we could have had an imp improved version that uh, could have passed mustard and provide, pr provided um, a great infusion of affordable housing stock to the city. Another funding source for um, addressing homelessness, um, I would love to see the state government provide annual funding to locally based community groups that work on homeless issues like the Lake City Task Force on Homelessness. Yes, we need a more progressive tax structure from the state uh, with the capital gains tax and income tax. Um, we also need to restructure the real estate excise tax. Um, that's right now a flat fee. Why don't we graduate that for more expensive homes contributing more? Um, but there are things we can do at the local level until we get those changes from the state. Why not impose a $1 fee on Uber and Lyft rides into downtown and dedicate those dollars to affordable housing? There's precedent for that in New York City. If we could move forward with congestion pricing, we could do that on a sliding scale. Um, so we remember equity. For bold action, let's lid I-5 and create more affordable housing and knit those communities in a very dense area to provide more housing. The reason it's so important is 46% of renters in our city are severely constrained. They're spending over 50% of their income on housing. This is Dan Strauss. I absolutely agree with the idea of litting I-5. I've had the opportunity to work on this project, and we've seen other cities like the District of Columbia be able to use space above freeways, then mix use it so that you're able to create the revenue that you need to have to build the housing. We're absolutely going to need uh, a lot of money to build the housing that, that we're, we've underperformed with, and we need to have our regional partners, regional partners in Snohomish County, Pierce County, King County, and I've got relationships in these places. I've got relationships at, this, at the state to be able to work on passing an income tax. And what we can do, to, what the city council can do today about the regressivity in, in our city is indexing our fines and fees to the value, for instance, a parking ticket. If a, a Mercedes gets a parking ticket, it should be paying more than a 1986 Honda. This is something that we can do today to benefit our Seattleites. We are shifting now to 30 second answers. Candidates, please remember to identify yourselves. Audience members, please remember if you have a question, write it down. Someone will come around and get that. We'll be getting to those soon. Uh, starting with John, the Move Seattle levy initially promised improvements for seven new rapid ride bus lines uh, for the routes. Now the full improvements are expected on three or four routes. What will you do to deliver the rapid ride expansions promised in the Move Seattle levy? This is John Peoples, and a promise was made. That promise needs to be kept by the city government. What that means is, as your city council representative, I will be seeking to audit all um, city uh, departments looking for money that we can use to make up the difference and fill out um, the rapid ride system that was promised. Hi, uh, Joey Massa again. As I said before, effective solutions require costly, or sorry, <laughs> effective solutions require costly solutions. Uh, the, the thing with that, often they're not just fiscally costly, they're politically costly. We need to elect leaders who are willing to stick their necks out for effective solutions and not welch on decisions that we've made and promises we've made to our residents when those political costs become uh, evident. As long as I've been paying attention, we've been estimating that projects are gonna cost one thing, and then when we actually go to implement them, they're like 3X every time. So it seems a little disingenuous that we keep repeating the same thing with the voters where we're telling them they're gonna get one thing, and then we deliver a completely reduced menu to them. Um, I've had some experience where even simple things, like I don't know whether SDOT has to literally bid these and stick to it or what we're gonna do, but I've had situations when I was working on traffic calming 
for uh, neighborhoods where they had no idea what things cost. Melissa Hall, the Move Seattle levy has underperformed and overpromised, and it's just kind of a thing that I don't see an easy way out of. What we can do in the future is make sure that levies are structured so that we have um, transit improvements happen um, with the money first, after that, bicycle improvements, after that, maybe some roadway improvements. Like, right now what happens is everything gets cut and it's not really an expression of our values. I'm, I'm a firm believer that uh, the way we start addressing climate change here, being the number one issue worldwide is through public transportation, development, housing. Uh, we're gonna have to keep a promise on this one and we're gonna have to get uh, creative as far as where we're gonna get this money. If we don't pay it now, we're gonna pay it 30 years from now, just like we did with uh, public transportation. We're doing a lot of talking and we need to uh, put this money up front and resolve these issues now. The bill is just gonna get bigger. Yeah, this is Jay Fathi. Um, you know, two words that are kind of boring, but they're very important is fiscal responsibility. Um, I don't know where that money went, but obviously we need to find it. And we just got done talking about climate change and how we need more buses and more rapid ride. And so absolutely, this is a high priority. We need to deal with it. And uh, we need to be very, very judicious and realistic when we're forecasting things around funding or fundings for levies and also just the city finances overall. Ed Parkhurst, it, it, um, I'm fortunate that the uh, Move Seattle levy has been reset, um, not just with regard to rapid ride line, but also with uh, regard to building out the bicycle trail network. And uh, those are really unfortunate. And I think um, partly it's a result of uh, planning that was not a, well performed when the uh, levy was put together. At the same time, the problem doesn't go away. We want more transit options sooner than later. Okay. I'm Heidi Wills. Um, it's due to public transit that I got involved in public service to begin with. Um, at the University of Washington, I was student body president and I helped um, get a UPASS program there, um, which was very controversial believe it or not, now it's an of course being modeled all over the country. But I ran for city council because Charlie Chong said some disparaging things about buses. And that's what fired me up. And on the council, I think uh, we need an advocate who will provide adequate oversight, advocacy, and help. Sorry, thanks. This is Dan Strauss. What we can do is we don't need to wait for the coaches that are w associated with bus rapid train or rapid ride here to be built for us to use everyday coaches on these routes. We understand that rapid ride attempts to be bus rapid transit. It doesn't perform because we don't have dedicated lanes for bus for the rapid ride to truly be bus rapid transit. We can do on all door boarding without having to wait for all of these uh, machines to be the card readers to be put in. We can get going with the resources that we have today. <laughs> Yes, we need more accountability and more transparency when it comes to city spending, absolutely. But I think the question was, how would we fund the gap when it comes to Move Seattle? And the answer is a transportation impact development fee that we would assess to large developers to raise more revenue, to raise new revenue, to invest in our mass transit and our public transportation systems. I already, I already okay. answered this. Okay, uh, Joey, you're first. Uh, what do you think is the most important strategy, a specific actual strategy or policy, Seattle can pursue to make the city affordable to live in and prevent displacement, especially communities of color? Uh, the short answer is density. Uh, we have a housing shortage. We have a housing shortage that's existed for nearly 20 years at a minimum. Uh, we need to be doing what we can to increase density with our, in our city. This is vital not only for uh, 
those disparities you spoke about in the question, but in addition to achieving zero uh, carbon emissions and those other goals that are so vital to our city. Um, one of the things that I'm talking about would help is I'm very much into owner-occupied communities because they really strengthen our neighborhoods and we can bring more people into them like I did. I suggest that we make zero interest loans available to owner occupants to be able to tuck a basement apartment or carriage house above the garage or a little rental suite in so that people can move into our neighborhoods and we can keep the owners that are there, including the older, the older people that are getting taxed right out of their houses. Melissa Hall, I think that one of the things that we, I agree, we need density. One of the other things I would very much like to see us do as a specific policy is expand our current concurrency program where right now we just look at the availability of transportation and transit to also look at the availability of housing when we build retail or we build office spaces that create a need for housing. If there isn't housing available, we should probably start stop driving the need. Sergio Garcia, I think the question here is, do we just want people of color in Seattle, or are we okay with, the living them, live, with them living in our neighborhoods? Uh, I wanna live in Seattle, and I wanna live in the nice neighborhoods that uh, most of us in here live. So it's very important to uh, do get creative, development's important, uh, meets the, uh, the demand, supply meets the demand, and it's also cr getting creative with ADUs, doing mother-in-law, so it gives people uh, like me the opportunity to uh, live amongst uh, everyone in here. Hey, it's Jay Favi. Uh, increased density, increased supply, and continue to be creative in ways that we can, uh, in our financing approaches, uh, particularly for communities of color and, and uh, groups and populations who have traditionally been underserved and marginalized. Ed Parkhurst, I think that one um, specific strategy that can be employed by the city is to um, expand the program of um, community housing um, Trust fund in the community, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, community uh, home dead um, program. And this is where a program whereby uh, the city buys the land and people build up equity through um, ownership of the building, the house, or the multi family unit they're in, rather than the land, so that lowers the cost overall. Heidi Wills. Um, you know, right now we are allowing for property tax exemptions for new buildings um, for uh, only 12 years, and uh, that's for 20 to 25% of those units. Um, 12 years goes by really fast, and I think that we need to allow for extension for that and also expand that for existing buildings, um, working uh, to increase the supply of more affordable housing. This is Dan Strauss, expanding and streamlining the ability for detached accessory dwelling units and attached accessory dwelling units to be used to keep people in their homes and to provide additional property tax relief for uh, larger sections of our population that are either on fixed incomes or are not making market 100% uh, area median income. We need to be able to keep people in their homes that they own. We do need greater density. We need density that looks like low-income housing, that looks like that important missing middle in housing, places where nurses and teachers can live. We also have an opportunity to expand zoning for duplexes and triplexes to bring in that lower income and moderate income of rental units, and then making it easier for people to build things like backyard cottages and mother-in-law units. We could do things like put those plans available, available online so that homeowners can download a plan. This is John Peoples, and to reduce cost of housing, uh, we need to in increase the density in our urban villages and bring that about by reducing code, regulations, rules, and permitting to reduce the cost of building low-cost housing. All right, K 
Kate, you're first for this question. According to SDOT, 45,000 city blocks are missing sidewalks, but the city only has the money to build 25 blocks per year. That means it would take around 1,800 years to complete the city's entire sidewalk network. What are you going to do about this? Yeah, Kate Martin speaking here. Um, I actually did a study in 2008 and 2009 with a $100,000 grant from Department of Neighborhoods, and I actually documented how we can finish the sidewalk network. We came up with four financing strategies um, that would all be successful. We worked with block studies, um, and we talked to neighbors who were ready to organize to get their sidewalks, so it was kind of based on organizing blocks and having three or four financing options. This is doable, we can do this, and we need to do it now. Melissa Hall, I think that getting sidewalks all over the area is gonna require a certain amount of creativity. The first obvious uh, option is to go in and add sidewalks when you restripe, but that's not gonna be an option for most of these places. What I would like to see is us figure out how to make sidewalk building something that a community can do together reasonably, because a lot of the uh, cost of that sidewalk is actually, actually labor, and it's something that communities care very deeply about, given cool kits they put them in. Um, Sergio Garcia talking. Uh, I, I think that we also, I mean, we need to get creative here. The sidewalks is not the only uh, issue that's gonna take us 18,000 years to resolve at this point. There's a few issues on the table that are probably gonna take us a little bit longer. Uh, you know, there's grants out there. We need to work with the neighborhoods. We need to get creative and find that money. That money is there. Uh, like I said earlier, I think, uh, you know, it's a hard sell right now to ask uh, people who are barely hanging on to their residents for more money. Uh, I've met knocking on doors and through work. I've met a handful of people. Uh, I don't know if it was 18,000 or 1,800, but um, wow, that's, uh, either way, that's absurd. And when you think about the core, the core functions of a municipal government, it's to provide for infrastructure and things like that. To, to hear that that is a projected cost is uh, beyond absurd. Being someone who has not yet worked inside city government, I would look for answers and I would call people like my friend Kate Martin. Sounds like she's got some of the answers already. At Potter, I would do two things. First, I would propose a levy to fund uh, sidewalk construction. Um, again, that would be a heavy lift, and it's not going to solve the problem overnight, but it would certainly uh, increase the level of the funding available for a sidewalk construction. The other thing I would do is um, expand um, the funding for cost-effective pathways in lieu of concrete sidewalks. Concrete sidewalks are very expensive, not just because of concrete, but because of drainage. Um, this is a really important issue, um, not just to able-bodied pedestrians, but to all of us, folks who are in wheelchairs, to seniors, to children, um, to people who are vision impaired, um, and it is a basic service of city government. Um, and I was able to dedicate more funds to sidewalks when I was on the city council and get the moniker Sidewalk Wills by building voting blocks. I locked arms with Nick Licata. And together, we dedicated more funds out of the general fund to, to sidewalks. Hi, this is Dan Strauss. I went to Nathan Hale at a time where there was no anything around the school. We walked around in the gravel. Today, when you walk around there, there's asphalt and there's paint. And while paint doesn't keep you separated from people who are driving, it does present a people a very clear path of where they should and should not be. We know that as Ed was saying, drainage is the most expensive aspect of creating sidewalks. And so when new development is occurring on property, we need to require that those sidewalks are built. We <laughs> the truth is, is that there's not enough money to do everything that we want to do in Seattle. And very few new funding sources have been identified by this panel tonight. 
So we do want to fight for those additional resources to make this happen. But in the meantime, we have to look at what sidewalk development projects are going to have the highest impact to get us towards our transportation equity goals, to get us toward our climate change goals. And then looking at building in neighborhoods that have historically been underserved. This is John Peoples, and I would uh, um, have a combination of creative financing um, to reduce the cost of all those um, sidewalks and community building and volunteer labor is a great idea. And at the very least, a curb to separate pedestrians from uh, vehicles and uh, bikes and um, and also uh, prioritize, um, leave the places where people don't want sidewalks to the very end. Hi, uh, Joey Massa again. I think one thing that I haven't heard so far yet is our lack of skilled labor. It's a, it's a national issue, and I think it's a local issue as well. We talk a lot about funding folks to go to community colleges, to colleges. I grew up in a union family. Uh, I know that part of the reason why these costs are so high is a lack of family wage jobs, a lack of individuals who are capable and willing to, to work on these types of projects and, and address the needs that we have. So do we need more funding? Absolutely, and those are challenges we have to overcome, but our labor pool also needs to grow. I'm going to move on to yes or no questions now. So get those signs ready, and then we will get to your questions. So if you have them, please write them down and give them to us. First lightning round question, and keep your card up because I'm going to read off the responses uh, so that this is accessible to everyone. Uh, first, do you support completing the Burke Gilman missing link along the preferred alignment on Shill Shoal? Jay, you gonna? Okay. So, Jay. Okay, we don't have time for that, but Jay is qualifying, Heidi is qualifying, and, oh, you, yeah. Uh, Sergio, no. Melissa, yes. Uh, Kate, no. Joey, yes. Uh, John, no. Uh, Terry, yes. Dan, no. Dan qualified, no. Uh, Heidi qualified something. Uh, Ed, yes. Do you support the proposed backyard cottage legislation? I'm seeing all yeses except for Kate and John. Is that right? All right. Do you support funding the center city connector streetcar? Got, uh, okay, Jay, yes, Sergio, yes, Melissa, yes, Kate, no, uh, Joey, no, John, no, uh, sorry, Terry, yes, Dan, yes, Heidi, yes, Ed, yes. Do you support implementing congestion pricing in downtown Seattle? Jay, yes, Sergio, no, Melissa, no, Kate, no, Joey, no, John, no, Terry, no, Dan, uh, in the middle somewhere, Heidi, yes, Ed, yes. Would you support allowing triplexes and quadruplexes in current single family zones? Jay, yes. Sergio, yes. Melissa, yes. Kate, no. Joey, yes. John, yes. Terry, yes. Dan, yes. Heidi, yes. Ed, yes. Do you support electric scooter sharing in Seattle? <laughs> Kate, do you have no, no position? Uh, OK. Jay, yes. Sergio, no. Melissa, yes. Joey, no. Uh, John, yes. Terry, yes. Dan, yes. Heidi, yes. Ed, yes. Do you support impact fees on new developments to fund transportation improvements? Looks like all yeses except for uh, who? Kate? 
transportation. Yes, specifically for transportation improvements. I, I can agree with that. Okay, so everyone yes except for Kate? All right. Do you support the proposed affordable housing development at Fort Lawton? Uh, okay, Jay, yes, Sergio, no, Melissa, yes, Kate, mm, no position, uh, sorry, Joey, yes, John, no, Terry, yes, Dan, yes, Heidi, yes, Ed, yes. Do you, uh, should Seattle grant tenants a right to counsel when they're facing eviction? This is a right to a lawyer like you get in other cases. Everybody says yes, no, except for John says no. And finally, uh, do you support a per ride fee on Uber and Lyft trips in downtown Seattle? Jay, yes, Sergio, yes, Melissa, yes, Kate, no, Joey, no, John, no, Terry, yes, Dan, yes, Heidi, yes, Ed, yes. Okay, we did it. Uh, your questions. Um, all right, so this person wrote, will you advocate for light rail to Ballard? Uh, but that's coming already. So the next part of the question, bridge or tunnel? So I think you all can make this quick. Bridge or tunnel? Okay, sure, yes is tunnel. So that means you're gonna find the money necessary to pay for the tunnel if it's not. <clears throat> All right, uh, Jay, yes, Sergio, yes, Melissa, no. Oh, sorry, tunnel, okay. Jay, tunnel, <laughs> Sergio, tunnel, Melissa, elevated, bridge, Kate, tunnel, Joey, elevated, uh, John, tunnel, Terry, tunnel, Dan, tunnel, Heidi, tunnel, Ed, tunnel. Would you support efforts in Olympia to legalize rent control? Uh, let's do this as a question because the person also asks, if not, what policy tool would you implement uh, instead of rent control? Although we've already, never mind, we've already talked about what you would do. So yes or no rent control in Olympia, would you support lobbying for rent control? Okay. Jay, no, Sergio, no, Melissa, yes, Kate, no, Joey, no, John, no, Terry, yes, Dan, no, Heidi, no, Ed, yes. Often community input means the voices of homeowners. What will you do to ensure that the city that the city's renters have a voice in public policy, given that they might have a harder time making it to office hours or taking time off work for council forums, et cetera. We'll start, who has the microphone? All right, Melissa. Melissa Hall, first of all, I am a renter. Second of all, um, this is why one of the wonders of the information age is that we don't actually have to drag people physically to office hours or meetings. We can do this stuff online. Um, we can have remote meetings, and we can take email comment, which is a really useful tool. This is Sergio Garcia, and I think there's something about being in person and being heard and not just getting a yes or no through an email or through a uh, forum. Uh, office hours, and I am a renter. I think that we definitely need another renter on council. Uh, right now there's only one, and I think they are in the process of buying a house. So if we want to uh, kind of be inclusive to renters or people of color, then uh, you're in luck. <laughs> Yeah, what is it? Just over half of the folks in Seattle are renters. We absolutely need to have <clears throat> the, the voices of renters heard without question. And I agree with Melissa, there's creative ways we can do it, whether it's flexing hours, whether it's virtual meetings, whether it's not, there's lots of ways we can do it, but we absolutely have to do it. Ed Pothouse here. I agree with Melissa that an online forum can be a great way of access for renters. 
I also think that uh, it's really important that um, th those of us who are homeowners understand that the objective here is to build um, inclusive whole communities throughout Seattle, which means homeowners, renters, all, people of all, all kinds. And it's really important that we take that perspective when thinking about affordable housing legislation and so forth. Yes, if Heidi Wills, um, I, if I get elected, I'd love to have an office in the district, in the Ballard Library, um, to make it easier for people to interface with their representative. Um, I would think we need more housing of all shapes and sizes uh, for people of all income levels throughout our city. And I think we need to bring back neighborhood planning. Um, and have it bottom up um, rather than top down. When I was on the council, we had a very robust neighborhood planning effort. Um, I've seen firsthand that it works. This is Dan Strauss. I'm also a renter, and so we, I'm a renter. I was the first candidate to say that I would open a district office, and I would also make the office hours available throughout the district. Even though I love Ballard so much, I know Ballard's not the only part of the district. Um, I would also make sure that we had hearings um, and office hours outside of the typical nine to five schedule. I am also a renter. Uh, but I think the conversation goes beyond renters and homeowners. And we, I'm thinking about how do I reach out to communities that have folks who are working two jobs or have folks who can't easily make it downtown. So where can I meet the constituents of District 6 it, where they're at, whether that's at a library or at a transit station or at a farmer's market to set up, to make, to be available, to hear the voices from the district. So renters, yes, homeowners, yes, but there's so many more communities that we want to make sure we're hearing from. John Peoples, I am a renter and I do not feel excluded because I'm a renter. Um, I would have uh, city council and committee meetings in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. So a wider variety of people can attend in person. I'd also have office hours in city hall and out here in the district. Um, the main thing is better communication of the agenda so that people can make plans to leave work early or take a day off so that they can attend. Uh, Joey Massa again. Uh, I own my boat, but rent my mortgage. So I guess I'm a little column A, a little column B. Uh, that being said, as many candidates have said, there are incredible information technology tools that allow us not only to gather information, but to aggregate that information to allow others to put their input, input on that aggregated information. Uh, further, you know, as everyone's saying, office hours. I don't think canvassing your district should end when your uh, candidacy ends. I think we should be as representatives out here and visible to our communities. I've gone to a lot of meetings over 20 years and we're, I don't remember anyone saying that renters couldn't come to the meetings. Um, I would like to get some communication tools out there. I think it could be technology oriented, but I think it also could be a um, district six advocate newspaper that I'm thinking of putting out when I'm elected so I can keep people informed about the important issues that are going on and maybe put a response card inside that they could answer some questions and just mail it back so that I could uh, take the pulse of what's happening out in the district. This is a bike lanes question. So if you would also like to address your feelings on the Burke Gilman missing link, please feel free. What bike projects in your district will you work to complete? And what else will you do to make biking a more practical, safer, and more accessible option across Seattle? So there is no other bike project in this district that anybody could argue that is more important than the, uh, the, one, the missing link. Uh, I think that right now it's, uh, it's, it, would be, it wouldn't be in my uh, position to give an opinion. I am still talking to both sides. I do have mixed uh, feelings. What I could tell you that uh, I do believe in completing the, the, the missing link, it is important. Um, I think I'm able, I will be able to do that. Um, it is also going through the judicial system right now, so I don't think that we should uh, give an opinion on it. And as far as uh, the bigger picture here, I think is education to be a little bit more uh, inclusive of people of color and other cultures. Hey, this is Jay Favi. The benefits of bicycling are enormous for a multitude of reasons, 
climate change, your health as a community health physician, as a family doctor, certainly, especially if you're wearing your helmet. Um, absolutely, we need to get more and more folks bicycling for a multitude of reasons. I support the bike master plan. It's a great blueprint. If anyone's not aware, they should look it up. It's got a really a nice roadmap map laid out. We have to continue to um, get more and more people to experiencing times out of their cars so they can appreciate bicycling and safety. <laughs> that was like the first time. You never had to hold that up for me. That was the first time. Thank you. Ed Parker, I strongly support completion of the missing link along the Bird Gilman Trail. It's been really frustrating how so many, so many years have gone by and yet the missing link is still there. And I would like to see that end as soon as, soon as possible. I think the preferred alignment on Chilshore is, is the most direct and beneficial one for the community. And I hope that the, commu the business community around along the way understand that this um, can be a benefit of them as a way of showing the community what the maritime uh, community is about. Heidi Wills, I sponsored the resolution to complete the Burke Gilman Trail along Shoal Shoal. That was 16 years ago. We haven't gotten very far. I do believe that the safety features there can coexist safely with existing businesses, but the existing businesses do not believe so. And they have not felt like they've had an advocate on the council. And if they don't have an advocate from District 6, um, who do they have? So I think we need to bring them with us in this discussion. Other ideas, thinking outside the box. I like the High Line um, in New York City. It maybe doesn't have to be a either or. It can be a win-win with an elevated. This is Dan Strauss. I started going to Burke Gilman Trail meetings when I was eight. <laughs> I have watched politician after politician fall on their sword and not get this done. We've got about a mile left to complete, and I think that we do need to come back together as a community. I, do, I didn't go to college right away after high school. And I went to AmeriCorps, and one of my options was jumping on a fishing boat or a family wage job on the docks. And we need to be able to preserve those, those jobs in our community. And we need bicycle infrastructure because I got hit by a driver. This issue is really close to me. I started my career on the maritime, in the maritime industry on the ship canal. And I understand the concerns that come from that industry that's so deeply under threat from so many other parts of their business as well. But it's time to complete the Burt Gilman link. It's time, time to complete the missing link. It's time to invest in getting the bike master plan done. And as I go door to door, the, the project I hear the most about in the district is the 8th Avenue bike lane. People are really interested in getting upgrades to that 8th Avenue bike lane as ridership picks up on that route as well. John Peoples, I strongly support the completion of the Burt Gilman Trail. Uh, mixed feelings, but that ship has sailed. Construction is beginning soon. Um, I want to be an advocate, however, for those businesses that stand to be adversely affected by the current uh, Shoal Shoal route. Elsewhere in the district, uh, at the very least, the green uh, paint uh, lets um, uh, other users of the road know that bikes may be there. So to kind of expand on my earlier statement, I live on the very end of the missing link. Uh, my wife and I live in a marina just behind Stone Gardens. So every day, I almost, I, I go to my gym, which is on the other end, next to Trader Joe's, which I also get my groceries there. And so on one hand, you have, if you, if you build it, they will come. On the other hand, we have a problem that already exists. I see bicyclists making poor choices. I see cars making dangerous choices every day on that route. And the reality is, it's only a matter of time until a dangerous accident happens because we haven't put infrastructure in place. As a planner, I'm kind of appalled by that route along Shell Shoal. Um, the Alaskan fishing fleet feeds America, and there's no reason to threaten those businesses. We have uh, very important maritime industrial land that um, we should not kill by a thousand cuts. Um, the route um, 17th is already a greenway. We could pick up 17th and then move uh, from there onto Leary Avenue, and, which is a tremendously wide street that would be very safe. Both of those, 17th and Leary Avenue, very safe. And I recommend that because uh, it would not adversely affect anyone. I support any route that gets the Burt Gilman connected. 
Um, but my understanding of the question was, it was what would we do to support bicycle infrastructure? Specifically, what I would like to see us do as a city is expand the um, tax credits and loan programs that we have for electric cars to electric bicycles, because I think that's a real winning opportunity for Seattle bicyclists. Much of Seattle's affordable housing is in buildings. Are you? Did you get, you answered that, okay. Much of Seattle's affordable housing is in buildings that are more at risk of collapse in a major earthquake. How should Seattle preserve its existing affordable housing while encouraging or mandating seismic retrofits that can be expensive? Who's, whose turn is it? Uh, you started last time, so Jay. Of course, I always get to start on the really easy questions, not. Um, I'm really sorry we had microphone confusion. Can, can you just like get to the nub of it again? What was the question? Uh, so a, a lot of affordable housing buildings uh, may be at risk in, of collapse in a major earthquake. Uh, how should Seattle preserve affordable housing while encouraging or mandating seismic retrofits? That's a problem. Um, obviously, particularly if it's affordable housing, we're going to be talking about underserved communities, uh, very likely communities of color, people that have been marginalized that um, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a very good question. That's something, it's not something uh, that we can tolerate. We need to do something about that, whether it's, yeah, I don't know, great question. Love to hear your input. Go back down this way. Just, let's just go back this way to make it easier. Sorry. Yeah. My turn. Um, I thought I was gonna have more time to think about this. <laughs> so it, it's a difficult question, right? But, but the reality is that we need to start paying attention to that. We're focused on so many issues in the city and we've forgotten uh, about uh, what happens if we get hit by an earthquake, right? We don't even have a plan as first responders. Um, that's why we need to encourage more first responders and nurses and uh, people who uh, could aid in such a situation and meet with the experts on what we could do to retrofit and moving forward, uh, what it is that we need to do to uh, start uh, building and uh, planning ahead for when that day uh, comes. It's not if, it's when. Um, unreinforced masonry is dangerous, unfortunately. Like you said, it takes up a lot of our affordable housing. Um, we can't deprive people of homes when we don't have any other place for them to live. However, we need to start doing visible disclosures for people who live in unreinforced housing, so unreinforced masonry housing, so they're at least aware of the danger that they're taking. It's not easy to find that information. And I would like us to start just massively building more housing. The problem with these buildings is that many of them are also historic, so it's not like they're gonna be retrofitted easily. Yeah, there's quite a variety of costs associated with um, retrofitting buildings, but um, my, my idea would be to provide zero interest, interest loans to help people afford to, um, on wood frame buildings to do the tie downs to the foundation, which is actually a pretty simple process. Um, for masonry buildings, it gets more expensive. Um, I think zero interest loans for that and for fire suppression systems in those affordable buildings would make a lot of sense and improve safety quite a bit. Boy, this question just like black swan events, they hit you when you're not expecting. Um, so as, as folks have said, increasing density is vital, creating more housing stocks so that we can create the opportunities for folks to move out of and restore those uh, unprotected buildings, uh, effective code legislation that looks to the future, uh, more than you know, just five years ahead, 10, 20 years ahead, and then again, communication with constituents, communication with residents who are living in uh, those dicey kinds of locations, letting them know the risks that they're currently facing. John Peoples here. While we're uh, building more low-cost housing, um, the retrofits indeed are expensive, and the plan would be to go one building at a time. Temporary housing for the current residents, a citywide call to housing for those residents who can then move back into their uh, retrofitted uh, building when the project is complete. Tax credits? loan assistance and technical assistance and support are how we can begin to do this work in the buildings that need it. It also proposes a unique opportunity while we're already working with building owners to encourage them to look at their energy use, energy consumption of those buildings and see how we can 
put in some incentives to help lower the carbon footprint from those buildings as well. Hi, this is Dan. Property or loans to reinforce unreinforced masonry are oftentimes not taken by property owners because when they go to sell the building, they're still stuck with the loan. So being able to tie those to the actual building is something that we can do. Tax credits and technical assistance is also things that we can do. Um, and we have these tools now. <laughs> Yeah, there, there, Heidi Wills, there is um, examples in place of how we do that to encourage conservation measures in existing affordable housing units. Um, it's ratepayers who pay, help pay for that through our public utility, Seattle City Light. If we want to do that with um, tax incentives and we um, decide as a community that that's a public benefit, um, I think though that right now we're finding that there's a huge need for more housing. And if we had additional dollars, they'd go there. At Park, Seattle is an earthquake prone city and the safety of all people living in Seattle is paramount. I think we can uh, come up with a program that would uh, slowly, um, that, that would, that would uh, steadily uh, retrofit the uh, unreinforced matronly building uh, over a period of time, and at the same time recognize that we have more affordable housing stock than we know. Other cities like Portland and Sacramento have been taking advantage of inexpensive hotels for temporary relocation. Okay, we are running out of time. Uh, we're going to start with you for this p final bit. Ed. It's just closing statements. You get one minute each. Please remember everyone is trying to distinguish among you all. So if you think there's something that really makes you stand out, please help the voters by telling us what that is. Uh, so one minute closing statements. And then Matthew from the Mass Coalition will come up and close us out. Ed, you're first. OK. Yeah. Um, Ed Parker, a bit about me. I was born with a hearing loss and I used cochlear implants and read lips to best understand people. I'm a planner with Seattle Parks and Recreation. Uh, I have 30 years of public service experience with the city of Seattle. Before Parks and Recreation, I worked with the Department of Neighborhood as a neighborhood court liaison and as a, fund, a grant funder to community groups all throughout Seattle. Prior to that, I worked for Seattle City Light uh, as, a, as an environmental and natural resources uh, protection specialist. Um, I'm running for city council because um, I, I want to see the city take strong action on urgent issues of climate change, affordable housing, homelessness, and uh, social justice, including increased police accountability. And I look forward to working uh, with the city, other city council members, other levels of government, the county, the state, to um, come up with a creative solution. And I look forward to seeing you on the campaign trail. Thank you. I'm Heidi Wills, and I'm the only candidate who's had this job before. It's been 20 years, but I think the fact that I've been a policymaker helps with so much turnover coming to the city um, with four new people, um, automatically maybe three more. And these are major challenging issues that we have before us. And these are issues that I've been in the trenches working on for three decades. I come as a policymaker, as a mom raising children in this community, um, two kids in middle school having lived in the district for over 16 years. I'm a nonprofit director specialized in youth development. I'm an environmental champion, having worked on issues related to sustainability for most of my life. Um, and I'm a collaborative leader who cares about listening and bringing your voices uh, to City Hall on the issues that affect you. Um, if I have an opportunity to serve you again, I've had a lot of life experience since I've been on the City Council, and I think I'll be a better policymaker. I'm serious. My name is Dan Strauss, and I have the knowledge and relationships to make the ideas that you've heard tonight into reality. I have almost a decade of legislative experience in four different legislative bodies, and I currently work for the city council. And I can take the relationships that I have today, the current relationships, and make uh, realities for you tomorrow. Um, I've already just this year coordinated work groups with the state, county, city, port, sound transit, and community to fund transportation projects, develop green building codes, improve our parks, 
Um, and I am so committed to creating a protected bike lane and protected uh, bicycle master plan throughout the city, not just our district. I'm born, raised, rooted in Ballard. I'm really excited to earn your, op earn the, your support and the opportunity to serve you. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. The stakes in this election, I'm sorry, Terry Rice, the stakes in this election couldn't be higher. It's truly a choice between continuing to respond to the crisis of today or stepping back and doing the hard work to invest in our future for Seattle 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. So that's a vision where you can walk to a grocery store or you're a block away from a metro transit stop or a light rail station where our communities have a diversity of age, of race, of income, and of occupation, where there's access to green spaces like parks, where the city, where you feel safe and the city is well taken care of. That's the vision that we can fight for. And almost, I mean, most importantly, where we're championing climate change policy and taking a wholesale adoption of the 170 point plan that Portland has put in use, and we're taking that fight to Seattle to make sure that we are truly climate leaders. John Peoples, and I'm running um, to represent you all on the city council to bring your voice back to the city council. Uh, that's been missing lately. Uh, I bring an engineer's uh, system-wide thinking perspective to upstream contributors to today's problems and um, uh, thoughtfulness of the downstream consequences. Seattle has a very bright, prosperous, uh, dignified future ahead of her, and we're gonna all participate and we're gonna um, do so without vilifying each other. Uh, there's a role to be played by everyone, and I'm looking forward to um, contributing to that. Um, vote for John Peoples, and 100% voter turnout and registration rate for August primary. Well, let's knock out the other council, uh, council districts in voting turnout. Uh, again, my name is Joey Massa and I'm running for city council as an independent progressive. One of the top questions I get when I'm out at canvassing in the district is what does progressive mean to you? And to me, the core belief of progressivism is that government should function as a living body, changing and adapting to the needs of its society. This is a thread that has been lost not only in our national politics, but in our local politics. This philosophy throughout our history has been used to incredible effect from leaders like Lincoln and Theodore Roosevelt to Woodrow Wilson or FDR. Effective progressives look at challenges straight on and ask not what is, but what can be. What can that future look like? Now, more than ever, we need leaders who are willing to lean into costly solutions, take political risks, and put the city before any other agenda. And that is what my candidacy is rooted in. I've served our state and nation as a veteran. I know how costly some of these services, some of that service can be, and I'm willing to be vulnerable in those ways. Yes, I'm Kate Martin speaking. Um, I've been a community member here in um, Finney Ridge, Greenwood for 33 years. I raised my children here. I'm a professional planner and designer, and I've made a career out of solving problems, and this job will be no different. All of our problems are fixable. All of our affordable housing um, problems are fixable. I have an outline of how we're gonna do it. As I mentioned earlier, uh, ownership is the ultimate rent control, so my goal is to get us from 42% home ownership to 75% home ownership. I just wanna make a note that I am walking the talk of density. Um, I'm, not, I'm a yes in my backyard person, but I do not want us to make the same mistake that we just made where we cause a feeding frenzy of investors um, and speculators in our neighborhoods. Um, no species uses density to measure quality habitat, and we should be no different than salmon or orcas in creating the kind of quality habitat that we actually need for humans. Humans are suffering, Fine. we can fix that. Fine. Thank you for your time, Kate Martin. Hello, my name is Melissa Hall. My wife and I and our two-year-old live in a quadruplex that was developed out of a single family home in Lower Fremont. Every day we both walk to work. We're lucky enough to have a great daycare across the street we can walk the kids to. We can stop by the grocery store on the way home. And we have a favorite breakfast place. It's a really high quality life. Unfortunately for us, it's also an expression of extreme privilege. 
That's what I want to change. I think a dense, urban, walkable lifestyle is an excellent lifestyle, and I'm not asking anybody to do anything that I'm not. As far as what I'm like, you probably shouldn't believe anything I say. I'm running for office. So instead, I'm going to make one more proposal that I didn't have a chance to fit in. We're not allowed to use traffic enforcement cameras to um, enforce people in transit-only lanes. So instead, I suggest we do a dual transit-only and tolling lane with the toll that reflects the cost of a person being in the bus-only lane. Sergio Garcia, uh, I, I don't think that there's all these candidates running throughout the city uh, and all these people are showing up to these forums because we are, are seeking uh, experience. If we were to live our lives based on just uh, looking for people with experience, uh, the first people that would be affected would be people of color, people of uh, limited uh, mobility, uh, women. Um, I think that we're here because we're fed up with what's going on. I bring an interesting perspective to the table. I've been knocking on your doors and petting your dogs and cats way before uh, this became uh, political. Um, I'm also the only one that hasn't been told to stop, I think, being uh, <laughs> to other people. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's just, I think it's time for change. I bring a voice of, of refreshment. I am just a person. I am just seeking for change. I think I could apply my skills of compromising um, and uh, making decisions, the right decisions for your best interest, uh, like I have been for over a decade now. Dr. Jay Favi, thank you again, everyone, for coming. Very inspiring to see the turnout and hear your questions. I've been a resident of North Seattle for the last 50 years. When I went to the University of Washington and medical school at the University of Washington, I chose to become a family doctor, and I chose to work at the 45th Street Community Clinic in Wallingford, taking care of people that didn't have health insurance, immigrants, people with severe addiction and mental health issues, and people that were homeless. I took care of hundreds of people that lived in their cars, lived under bridges. I've got a career that's centered around taking care of people that have less. I started a community health program at Swedish and ended up running an Obamacare health plan that put 250,000 people on health insurance that didn't have it before across our state. My wife and I have lived in this district for 21 years. She's a nurse practitioner and a professor at the UW, and we have two kids in public schools, and I look forward to working with you and for you as your city council member. Thanks.